first of all, uh, welcome to our second in the series of Digit Debates. It's great to see such a great interest in this from a right across the globe in many ways. So welcome on a wonderful wet Wednesday in Brexit Britain. Hope the weather's better where you are. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, be able to open this second series of the debates that have been funded through the Economic and Social Research Council. So thank you very much for that. And um, we want to say this term will start off with a whole series we hope you'll find a very interesting and diverse range of speakers across issues related to AI at work and the regulation of employment. So I hope you'll find a real treasure trove of, uh, of events there. And also the ones that we held last term are also available on the website and I'll put a little link in shortly if you haven't got that. Now, with no further ado, let me hand over to our esteemed and much loved colleague, Simon Deakin, who's Professor of Law and Director of the Cambridge uh, Centre for Business Research at Cambridge University. And Simon today is going to give us a really up to date analysis of what's been happening with regard to different changes in employment, in particular in the United States around uh, dependent, independent contractors. So all the details are on the website if you want to know more about Simon. And uh, Simon, let me hand over to you, please. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jackie. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Is that working? No, hang on. Share. Okay. Is that working? I hope yes. so. Yeah, that's all fine. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to talk about decoding employment status, and um, the theme I want to address is related to the question of how lawyers define employment, and this is particularly. Um, important for the protection of gig workers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the Californian case, uh, the, the ABC test for identifying an employee, um, Proposition 22, the, uh, the new law which um, Uber um, has, in a sense, been, been able to procure for itself through um, a statewide plebiscite, um, which determines Uber drivers to be independent contractors. I'll say a little bit about that later. But the theme I want to address is slightly wider, and it's to do with the, the nature of the process through which the law um, defines terms like employee and independent contractor. Um, the, the nature of um, a legal idea or legal concept like that, um, and how it contributes to the role law plays in, in ordering the gig economy in, in a broader sense. And I want to explore the idea that law itself is a kind of information system um, and may be susceptible to digitalization. So it's not just the law's impact on digitalization, it's digitalization's impact on labor law I want to, to talk about. And the, the, backdrop, the, the backdrop to this um, research um, is work I've been doing for quite a while, um, applying uh, systems theory to our understanding of law, um, and in particular, evolutionary concepts. Um, I'm interested in how ideas and complexity theory um, and cybernetics can be used to understand legal systems. Um, and law's long run coevolution with technology, the idea that law itself has algorithmic properties, is something which lawyers themselves are interested in. And especially those lawyers who want to digitalized law, the so-called legal tech movement, which is influencing law firms a lot, and also has led many to suggest that perhaps aspects of the judicial function could, could even be automated, robo judges. Um, so in, in principle, um, we shouldn't just think of law as responding to technology. Technology itself is socially embedded, and I would argue is legally mediated meaning that many technological developments require a legal system. They require innovation to be protected by intellectual property law. And also the wider consequences of Schumpeterian creative destruction for the economy and society need a legal system, labor and social security law to deal with the, the consequences of rapid technological change. So the legal system facilitates technology diffuses it, maybe protects us from it to some extent. And law may appear to be out of sync with technology and to be lagging behind it 
but that's not always the case. In many cases, technology needs law to do something in order to evolve. Um, digitalization is a long run process. The idea of turning tacit knowledge into code is at least as old as the industrial revolution itself. The, the Jacquard loom, in a sense, took the tacit knowledge of the guild and through an early form of binary code, as you can see here, um, rendered it um, commercializable um, and also permitted the accumulation uh, through the capitalist firm of profits on a scale that hadn't previously been realized. The invention of the factory in the end, of course, displaced the guild. And when the guild was displaced, a legal model of the cooperative economy, which was in a sense pre-capitalist, it wasn't easy to distinguish between labor and capital in the guild, that legal model disappeared along with the guild structure and the modern employment relationship and the contract of employment um, in the end were the consequence of that major legal shift. Are we seeing a similar shift today away from the employment contract to some new legal form? Well, maybe, but um, it seemed to me that digitalization uh, of the sort we're now experiencing um, may indeed be um, simply a scaling up of a process which has a long history and industrialization uh, producing the contract of employment, uh, producing a labor capital divide, that doesn't seem to be about to go away. And I wonder if the employment contract is quite as otiose and old fashioned as some people make it out to be. I do not think we're about to see a return to the guild as a consequence of uberization. Lawyers and uh, computer scientists and others um, have developed the idea that the legal system itself is algorithmic, that the process of using um, legal rules, but not just rules, concepts, abstract ideas, principles, standardized text to um, create a normative order, um, this, this, this creates a legal system which has informational properties. Um, it's a form of collective cognition, which depends in part upon the community of lawyers sharing certain beliefs and assumptions about legal process, but also the legal system captures understandings which are widespread in society, which may be social norms or conventions in the game theoretical sense and sense of evolutionary game theory. And if law has algorithmic properties, maybe law itself can be um, computed. Um, so Max Tegmark suggests that legal decision-making can be abstractly viewed as computation. There's an input-output process, and maybe we can apply artificial intelligence to this process of legal classification. And Ben Allery takes the idea of the singularity and calls it now the legal singularity. When we have enough knowledge and we can process it using machine learning, it may be that we can replace human legal decision-making with some kind of automated process. Um, now, obviously big data and the, the advent of the internet and Google um, creating data on a massive scale um, alongside innovations in technology and in the mathematical underpinning of machine learning suddenly make artificial intelligence or machine learning anyway possible on a larger scale. If we can hoover up this information and develop legal algorithms, which are the equivalent of those used for facial recognition, Allery argues what becomes possible is legal completeness. Now, at the moment, um, we use natural language as a medium for um, legal ordering and expression. And natural language inevitably creates the, the possibility of incompleteness, incomplete law. For some people, that's always been a problem. If only it were possible to have complete law. So we'd always know, for example, who was an employee and who was not. The mirage of, I think it's a mirage of complete law comes into view with the, the prospect of big data and the legal singularity. Now, the comparison between law and machine learning is not entirely um, fanciful, I think. And it's interesting that machine learning, at least using neuronal models, um, often uses some of the same language um, that lawyers use. So a, a neuronal model of machine learning um, uses terms, of course, derived from neuroscience. So we, we talk about synapses and neurons 
this is a kind of brain science model of machine learning. And this sort of machine learning involving self-correcting algorithms, deep learning implies an input output process and an error correction process, um, which uh, uses a kind of number crunching technique to mimic long run evolution. It's been called a kind of direct fitting process, which is similar to the process of the direct fitting of nature, which goes on with DNA and the natural environment. Uh, of course, this can be massively speeded up using machine learning. Back propagation and gradient descent, these mathematical um, ideas have legal equivalents. It's interesting that computer scientists talk about adjusting weights um, in machine learning, and they talk about factors, they even talk about concepts, and the concept can emerge from the adjustments of weights um, in response to um, inputs from the environment. There's an input output process. Um, lawyers use very similar technology when deciding whether somebody is an MP or an independent contractor. They break this question down into factors which are to which are attributed weights and concepts emerge uh, in an emergent way from, from this process. Uh, lawyers were using these terms before computer scientists appear to have started to use them. Maybe they have a common source. Anyway, um, these um, parallel um, developments have led many to believe that it, sh it should be possible to automate the legal process. Now, um, what do we mean by legal evolution? Um, there's been quite a big debate about this going back a long way, but most recently, um, Chicago School law and economics scholars like George Priest have argued that a kind of error correction direct fitting process goes on with litigation being used to select out rules that don't work. So the basic idea is that there's an inbuilt evolutionary process in litigation. If a rule is inefficient, is causing at least private costs to certain actors, they will litigate against it. And Priest's fundamentally important observation is that rules which work are very rarely, if ever, challenged. So litigation tends to be about rules that impose private costs and thereby create incentives for litigation. And he argued that applying a kind of Markov chain model, over time, the inefficient rules are purged through litigation. And this is a feature of a common law system relying upon precedent. So in this, in this model, um, mutation, this is the, um, well, the equivalent of mutation is judges deciding cases slightly differently as the facts of cases alter. Is a gig worker an employee? Are they like a factory worker? And so on. But selection, ex post natural selection, the legal equivalent is litigation. If the judges get it right, the rule isn't challenged. If not, it's challenged. And eventually the, the rule will tend to tip into a different rule. What's missing from this model, critically, is any understanding of the legal equivalent to inheritance or retention in the variation selection retention evolutionary algorithm. How are legal rules stabilized? And the answer is, I think, the conceptual, dogmatic, abstract linguistic framework of the law. When a judge needs to decide if a gig worker is or is not an employee, they do not start from scratch. They use an existing legal conceptual language, employee, contractor, and beneath employee and contractor, they may talk about a control test or an economic reality test or some other test. And what the judges do is continuously being subjected to litigation type selection. We have equivalence in law to information retention and error correction. But the implication I think is that um, just as with nature, this is a path dependent, non-ergodic time irreversible process, which doesn't automatically produce optimal rules. There are dead ends, evolutionary frozen accidents, and often the law is slow to adjust, absolutely. Carl Llewellyn, the um, American uh, legal realist um, theorist of the 1930s and later law professor at um, Chicago and Columbia, here viewed in his environment, the law library, that's where all the stuff is, wrote a book called The Bramble Bush to describe the nature of the common law. Again, uh, using maybe a natural metaphor, the common law just seems to grow in this unruly way but maybe has a certain form nonetheless, there's a kind of spontaneous order to the common law. But Llewellyn um, 
pointed out the importance of precedent, like cases must be decided alike, and this in a way is the meta rule of the legal system. Justice involves treating equal cases equally and unequal cases differently, and precedent can be both limiting but also empowering, and natural language always gives, because of its incompleteness, gives a judge the possibility of developing the law and assisting its evolution when new cases come along. So the bramble bush carries on growing in this unruly way, precisely because we use natural language and not mathematical algorithms as our medium of expression. And natural language has many uh, possibilities, which perhaps are not available to us with machine learning. Another way of thinking about this is legal incompleteness. It's useful that the law is incomplete, it's inevitably incomplete when it meets its boundary with the economy. So there's bound to be some incompleteness when the law responds to technology, when a new phenomenon like Uber, relatively new, comes along. That chaos at the edge of the legal system is counterbalanced by the internal order produced by the rule of self-similarity, which is a kind of fractal um, organization of the legal system. The doctrine of precedence creates self-similarity in the modular structure of the law, Benoit Mandelbrot's idea of a fractal. So here's an idea. I've compared law at various points in my career to a number of things, but maybe law is like a snowflake, as you can see here. These are fractal structures. Now, concepts like employee are really a way of embedding complex information from thousands and thousands of cases. And these ideas evolve over time, and also they change their meaning. The term employee in the middle of the 19th century was largely concerned with middle-class workers, professionals, managers, executives, solicitors. Today, the employee, meaning a wage-dependent worker, well, that's not what it meant a century ago in a series of mutations brought us to the point where we have now arrived at. So Lumen argued that concepts are historical artifacts through which we retrieve past experiences. Um, they code, you might say, for past adaptations. There's encoding of social facts into a concept and decoding when an employer or a lawyer or a worker interprets the term employee and the legal definition of the employee is not exactly what it would be in everyday life. These are specialized terms. So the legal system has a boundary with society, with the economy and within the legal system, a term can often have a specialized meaning. It has a juridical meaning, which is distinct from its social meaning, if nonetheless connected to it. Now, when we think about employment status, um, we can use a, a, a kind of algorithmic logic. There's a binary decision to be made. You're either protected or not protected. And employee, independent contractor, many people have suggested these are very arbitrary terms. A distinguished employment lawyer, labor lawyer, Bill Wedderburn, argued that the test lawyers use to identify an employee is the so-called elephant test. You know one when you see one, but it's very hard to define one. Yes, okay, fine. I don't think, however, that the legal approach is really that arbitrary because below this very wide term, there are certain intermediate concepts and below those there are the factors. And there's a lot of, um, as it were, dynamic interaction between the high level concept, the intermediate concept and the subordinate concept. Um, and one might think of a term like employee as being built up out of these intermediate level concepts like economic reality. Am I in business on my own account? Control, do I have a boss? Um, integration, am I part of a structure? Now the, the, the gig worker, there's much dispute about whether a driver for Uber or a courier for Lyft um, has their own business. Um, are they just using the platform as a technology to link to the customer? Legally, is a contract between the driver and the passenger? Is there a contract at all between Uber and the driver? And if there is a contract, is it an employment contract? Uber says, no, we're not the employer, we're just the intermediary. Um, we're running a network business, not a taxi business. Uh, the courts are grappling with this. In the UK, the Supreme Court is about to give a ruling in a case called Uber and Aslan, where they're trying to figure out whether Uber drivers are so-called Lim B workers, not quite employees, but with some of the rights of employees, including the right to the minimum wage. In America, the ABC test developed by the uh, Californian Supreme Court 
very much would have brought gig workers within the scope of the employee concept by stressing what I've called here the economic reality criterion. Um, does a gig worker employ others? Not normally, they can do. Do they take a profit? Well, basically, they're getting a fee, but Uber determines the residual, um, essentially. Um, does Uber control the gig worker? Arguably, yes. There's a lot of surveillance of drivers. They, they're not completely free. If they don't do a good job, they get disciplined or taken off the, 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 the app. Now, uh, below these uh, lower level um, factors, we also see uh, complicated um, individual cases. At some point, you reach the limit of the legal system and you're into the economy and we run out of law. But the legal system is very good at receiving information from society through litigation, through legislation, and then coding it into an abstract form. And what's going on with the debate about Uber is, of course, at one level, a political debate about whether Uber can escape the coverage of employment legislation. You might say that um, you can apply, employ an algorithmic approach, but I would argue that at the end of the day, identifying an employee is not like identifying an elephant or like identifying a face. There are real limits to how far you can use machine learning to identify employees, because at the end of the day, the category employee is socially and linguistically constructed. It doesn't exist in nature. Um, so what the court is doing is both defining the employee while applying the concept to the facts of a given case. Simultaneously, the court is defining the idea it is then applying. And this reflexivity between the law and its context, the law is shaping its context, is not like the process where, whereby machine learning identifies an invariant natural phenomenon like the shape of an elephant or somebody's face. We have to remember that this reflexivity can be very confounding and confusing and probably will frustrate actually a lot of the attempts to use machine learning to uh, substitute for legal judgment. We see all this coming together in the Uber case. Um, uh, on the one hand, Uber's trying to argue that the gig workers are not its employees, it's not responsible for them. At the same time, um, Uber has an eye on the idea that the whole process of decision making might itself be Uberized. So it's not just um, the law responding to Uber by maybe classifying drivers as employees. Uberization affects the idea that the law itself could be automated. Um, there are real dangers here, I think, in terms of the loss of um, judgment and also the, the supposed depoliticization of the law. But in reality, those like, those like Ben Allery who argue for um, the legal singularity are also those arguing that mostly these workers are independent contractors and are better regarded as such. In the Californian case, what we see is, of course, a political tug of war. The, the courts, on the one hand, expand the notion of the employee. What the court did in the ABC judgment and dynamics was to take the economic reality um, criterion uh, as its benchmark. And this means reweighting the lower level indicators so less stress is placed upon something like substitution, the right to substitute another, a major factor in the UK case law, and more emphasis is given to factors which would widen the employee concept, like do you employ others, do you make a profit? So the court in the dynamics judgment is pushing in one direction, Uber uh, and Lyft are then able to mobilize uh, support for Proposition 22, because in California it's possible to reverse a statute or a court judgment by um, a plebiscite essentially, and Proposition 22 uh, changed the law so there's a, a strong, well, pretty much irrebuttable presumption that if you drive for Uber or deliver for Lyft, of course, Uber and Lyft are not mentioned as such in the law. They talk about network companies, okay? But the, the real effect is that um, there's, a, there's a presumption now, very strong one, that if you work for Uber or Lyft as a driver or a courier, you will be an independent contractor. And Uber spent $200, $200 million mobilizing a campaign for Proposition 22, saying it would quit the state if it wasn't adopted. Fine. Um, the, the Proposition 22 was adopted by quite a large majority, well over 50% of those voting. And it's going to be very difficult to get rid of it because it can't be overridden by a statute unless there's a seven eighths uh, vote in, in the legislature to do so. There's got to be another plebiscite really to get rid of it. In the UK, meanwhile, 
and probably any week now, the Supreme Court will tell us whether the Uber drivers are workers, Limby workers. And they may well then be entitled to the minimum wage, but not to other employment rights because as Limby workers, they don't get unfair dismissal rights. In the UK, there's no possibility of a plebiscite, um, but the court judgment will not be the end of the story. If the Supreme Court decides that the Uber drivers are not workers, then this is pretty much the end of the matter until there's legislation. Because the effect would be to really exclude any possibility of workers getting protection of the, of, of the sort demanded in this case. If the Supreme Court holds that the Uber drivers in this case are workers, that's not the end of the story either, because Uber will, will refashion its contractual boilerplate, it already has done this, with a view to um, making a stronger case next time that its workers are not employees or, or indeed workers. So this is what we would expect. There would be litigation. Um, there's some kind of selection process going on. Um, we don't know the outcome. Um, and what we're seeing, of course, is a very powerful uh, dynamic, non-linear adaptive process. But I don't think we can conclude that it necessarily ends with the destruction of the employment contract. The employment contract is not just an abstract idea. It performs an important public function um, of ensuring a sound tax base and a certain, I would argue, um, fair, but also maybe efficient uh, distribution of risk between labor and capital. And without the employment contract, um, it would be difficult to maintain fiscal stability in its current form, especially because labor is less mobile than capital, but also without the employment contract doing its work of allocating risk between the parties, a lot of other things would fall away, including significant protections for both sides, I would argue. Capital needs labor at the end of the day, and the strategy being pursued by Uber and Lyft really is a, a very antisocial and destructive one. Um, and if pushed to its logical conclusion, would lead to the disintegration of significant uh, flows of resources and processes for risk allocation, which have an important public function in constituting a labor market. So it's by no means clear that this will result in the, the abolition of the employment contract, but let's wait and see how that goes. So there are major questions for those who believe in legal tech about whether we can apply notions like ground truths and optimization, but also um, we need to understand that law is vulnerable to algorithmic reasoning um, and protecting law's autonomy in the face of technological change is going to be difficult um, and we can't expect law to just protect itself. I think there's, there's a strong argument here for um, concerted action to defend law's autonomy from technological change, if we wish to maintain uh, the rule of law as a value in our societies. Okay, thanks very much. And I'm gonna try and stop the screen sharing. Okay, I think it's stopped already, excellent. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Simon. As usual, uh, extraordinarily rich and um, fascinating discussion. I mean, one of the things I think is great about your work is your ability to transfer, you know, quite intense uh, legal debates into the, how they fit the socioeconomic reality. We're going to open up for questions here. So if you would like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand, I believe, uh, or put a question in the chat. So let me make sure I can um, open that and see that. Um, so while I'm waiting for people to collect their thoughts and um, respond to some of the points you've made, I had a couple of uh, questions to kick us off. First of all, um, could I ask you, could you give us a little bit more detail about the California case? Because although you touched upon it here, there's a lot of people here who may or may not know about it to varying degrees. And I think it would be just useful to understand what has been discussed there in a little bit more detail and how it compares to the debates in the UK. And related to that uh, kind of specific question, uh, what I would be interested in knowing is like, when we do international comparisons of regulating employment, we know because judicial systems are influenced by very different philosophical principles, actors, although they may be called judges across Europe, actually have quite different roles and functions. Would you, is there any way we could explain uh, what are the kinds of factors 
that might shape the way some of these decisions are being made. And maybe we'll just reduce ourselves here to the UK US comparison because the broader European judicial system is quite difficult to understand as well. So the, the question then is, could you tell us more a bit about California, how it compares to the UK? And what are the factors that explain why particular types of decisions will be made in those jurisdictions? Because to link it back to some work we're doing with a, a major retailer in the United States who are very interested in this, uh, and they are also interested in what's happening in Europe, is they want to understand how that will affect things like their um, supermarket delivery program and what are the contracts of the people that delivered their shopping compared to the people who are in the warehouses. So this is a real problem that they're facing and trying to understand. Sorry, that's a lot of questions. And then um, I'll give you a chance to think about that. And then I'll look over to the questions that are coming in on the chat and work out if I can see how people can raise their hand. Right, Simon, is that enough for you for the moment? Yeah, so, so basically um, uh, employment lawyers and indeed lawyers generally distinguish between employees who are protected by labor law uh, the right to the minimum wage, et cetera, and so-called independent contractors or self-employed people who are generally not protected. The LIMBY worker concept um, is really there in, in UK law to describe somebody who is not an employee, but is economically dependent on another's business. So it's a third category between the pure employee and the pure entrepreneur. That, that LIMBY category was created in the late 1990s by the then Labour government, although there were some precedents for it. So the Lim B refers to a section of the statute, the Lim B worker has the right to the minimum wage and working time protection, but not to unfair dismissal protection or to a number of other statutory rights. In principle, they're self-employed, they don't have a contract of employment, but they're not running a business, right? Okay, so somewhere between the genuine entrepreneur who employs others and runs a business, and in effect uses company law to regulate and govern their business risks and a pure employee who's exposed to um, discipline, instruction, occupational risks, physical risks. In between these two, there's the so-called dependent contractor or Lim B worker. Now, in California, the dynamics decision of the Supreme Court pushes the notion of the employee way over to include the dependent contractor. Uh, everybody except the entrepreneur really becomes an employee. That was also the position in, in English law until the 1970s. Um, in English law, a different test called mutuality narrowed the range so that part-time workers, casual workers and others and gig workers later were outside the employee concept. The Californian decision uses a test called the ABC test, um, which um, American lawyers devised to basically say, if your client is running their business and it looks like you're part of it and you don't run a business and they give you orders, unless there's very clear evidence otherwise, ABC, you're an employee. And that test would have made all the Uber drivers employees. Then you get Uber organizing this massive campaign to reverse this by, by, by a plebiscite, which they did. And the new law under Proposition 22 basically says, if you're um, a network company, and they, they quite weirdly refer to distribution network companies and transport network companies, also known as Lyft and Uber respectively, but it's a law, so they don't just say it's for Uber's benefit, right? Okay, they use an abstract concept, TNC, transportation network company, but not employer, right? Okay, if you're one of those, your, your drivers specifically and nobody else are independent contractors. It, it, it may also, this may also be unconstitutional, for obvious reasons, they're carving out an ad hoc exception to benefit themselves. So it's going to be challenged before the constitutional courts and may get struck down. This is not the end of the story. But of course, the UK debate is somewhat different. The, the Limby worker idea already provides this third route and the Supreme Court may or may not decide that they're workers. Now, my point is that notions like employee, Limby worker are legal inventions. You know, the, these things don't exist in nature. And the legal system is defining employment in the process of applying the idea. And this reflexivity is something which greatly complicates the, the process, but we need to be aware of it. Um, it is not like identifying a tree, rock, stone or face. It's a, political, it's a political event, an act, but also one using abstractions which lawyers use to impart order 
So a judge will, of course, be driven by their perception of what they think the right answer should be, but they have to give their judgment using abstract language. They have to use legal justifications for what they're doing. And this is a constraint. If at the end of the day, what Uber has done is carve out an ad hoc rule for Uber, this goes against the notion of the rule of law applying equally to everybody. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if at some point it's challenged constitutionally, which can happen in the United States, it may be struck down. So again, the legal meta norm of like cases must be decided alike kicks in, regardless of the substance or content of what's being argued for. And that is a constraint, I think, on special pleading by, by platform companies. So we'll see how that goes. I don't think I answered all your questions though. No, there was a, a, just briefly, I mean, what do you think, so I know there's a, a Richard Patterson wants to come in with some questions and anybody else, if you'd like to put them in the chat and I'll call on you. What do you think are the factors that will shape the way British and American judges make these decisions? I know you talked about machine learning, algorithmic decision-making, et cetera, but are there um, the way those particular group of professionals are constituted in the ideological ways they see the world or interpret it, the shape of the other actors within the system, how they influence it. Do you think there will be a difference in the way decisions are made in the US and the UK, for example? And if so, what will shape that? No, I, I, I think um, to some degree, judges um, everywhere, more or less, uh, understand a, a norm of legality that's independent of the content of a rule because that's part of their professional training. So any lawyer will undergo a professional training, which, is, which constantly reminds them of the boundary between law and politics and law and the economy. Um, it's part of our training to explain the world through a juridical lens. And no matter what a judge's sympathies may be, they do not get to be a judge unless in their professional practice, they've exhibited some loyalty to the, the norm of legality in that sense. So a judge will feel constrained I think to decide according to what they would call principle. Now it's, it's hard to convey this to a non-lawyer because this is, this is not a part of everybody's training and I know lots of political scientists and economists who describe themselves as realists would deny this really happens, that judges just decide on pragmatic or political grounds. They do decide on pragmatic grounds. One of the greatest judges and a lawyer economist, Richard Posner, famously said that he knows what the outcome of a case ought to be, and then retrofits it using whatever concepts he's got available. I don't dispute that this goes on. Although Richard Posner, one very rarely sees any clear economic sentiment in his judgments actually, although he's very liberal on, on cultural issues. Um, on the economy, you don't really, he's pretty neutral actually. But what even Richard Posner does is he always decides a case using the medium of natural language and juridical forms to, to reach an outcome. A judge cannot decide a case solely on the grounds of politics or economics. If you take the Uber decision, what you see at tribunal level is it's extremely sophisticated judgment by, by the employment judge um, over tens, to many, many, many pages. Okay. And I, I was watching the Supreme Court um, arguments online last year when the, when, when the case was being argued. You, re you really see lawyers trying to grapple with a very difficult social problem and the way they arrive at a solution is different from the way that, that legislators would, would, would arrive at one. I don't think it's certain who will win the case in the Supreme Court, but reasoning by analogy, reasoning according to abstraction is the way that, is the way that these lawyers proceed. I think that's, that's right. And I think you would find the same in France where Uber has been described as an employer and is liable to pay the minimum wage. You would see the same in China where the same issue is arising. And again, in Chinese case law, you see both, but you also see Uber or its equivalent in China being called an employer. So, yeah, I think in all jurisdictions, I think lawyers do share a certain cognitive, um, they, they have a certain cognitive base in common just because they're lawyers, yeah. Thank you, Simon, that's fascinating. I could ask you loads more questions, but let's hand over, first of all, Richard Patterson uh, has a question he had in the chat. Uh, and after that, Sean Jones also had some comments he wanted to make. So, Richard, could I hand over to you to make your question and comments? And when you do so, could you introduce, could you unmute yourself? And could you introduce yourself and where you're from? Because I know we've got a really very broad audience here today, which is fantastic. Thank you, over to you, Richard. Hi, hi, Simon, really interesting. Can you see me, hear me? Can anybody see me, hear me? Yes, I can hear you, you're fine. Yeah, okay, can you see me? No. Anyway, okay, hi Simon. Uh, really interesting. And uh, my question was basically, 
you know, this the underpinning theoretical approach you adopted. I um, mean, you talk about uh, the use of complexity theory, and then you talk about the evolutionary principle in, the, in litigation. I just wondered whether uh, your analysis uh, utilizes at all the notions of uh, the NK principle or the notion of the fitness landscape. I can see it, how it could fit the fitness landscape when you talk about the uh, selection art of inefficient rules. But do you use the more, I suppose, uh, the, the, the empirical bits of the, the complexity theory at all? Um, is that clear? Yeah. Is that uh, well, clear? It doesn't look clear from your frown on your face. No, I, I, I think I did hear it. Are you hearing yeah. Internet no, connection no, so, is so, unstable, it says. It's a bit unstable, but, but no, no, I, I think one has to be careful in applying um, ideas from cybernetics or evolutionary theory to law. Um, but I think the scope to, to do so, um, as, as, as long as we observe, I guess, the, the need not to be too reductive or, or, or to, to take a just-so story approach to understanding legal change. Th there's been a vast literature going back centuries, actually, uh, applying evolutionary ideas to law. So there's nothing really new about that. All I've done is update it, yeah. To be Uh, Richard, did you want to come back and respond to that, or you looked like you did, but and you have to unmute you because I'm I muted you. No, uh, okay, that good. looks like a no. Right, I can I hand back, to it? Yeah. Richard? Richard, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No, just cut, he cut out basically. I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's fair enough. I mean, basically, the so yeah, that's fine. Okay, Thank. Cool. Sorry, it, it, it cut out. I, I mean, I, I was going to say that um, um, uh, applying these ideas empirically. Um, is, is a big challenge, but something that can be done, in fact, using machine learning models, but not those, I think, not simply those which use uh, a neuronal um, direct fit brute force approach. I think there are other models which use what I might call um, extrapolation to explain legal reasoning, not just interpolation in a cybernetic sense. And uh, these, are, these are AI models which would be rather different from the ones which lawyers have so far been using. And that's part of my critique of the legal tech enterprise. They're not using the right models to describe judging. They're using models which are interpolative evolutionary models, which describe very long run legal evolution. But what the judge does when she decides a case is she extrapolates from uh, a mental image or concept or textual uh, idea or concept uh, interpolation of the sort used in machine learning describes a different process, I think. Anyway, but that, that, that may be for another day. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Right, could I hand over to Sean uh, Jones and then Brendan Birchall has a question as well. So Sean, would you like to introduce yourself and summarise what you've put into the chat here, please, and say where you're from? Thank you. Certainly, I'm an employment lawyer. I'm an employment barrister at 11KBW and I'm a fee paid employment judge. So I'm involved in litigating worker status cases, including the Hermes and DX delivery driver cases. But I also hear these kind of cases. And I'm very interested about the scope for reducing law to algorithms for obvious reasons, because it would be of enormous assistance on, on its face. But what I wonder about is this, and I wonder if Simon has a view, which is that whilst judges love a clear guidance, they hate to be bound and they hate to be bound not least because of the problem Simon that you very clearly and I think helpfully identified which is that if you produce a bright line test of the kind which is most easily reduced to an algorithm what that does is assist a party with unequal bargaining power to redefine the relationship to escape all the consequences so what judges do is take this stuff but they're also simultaneously constantly undermining it. So if you think about the Limby worker, for instance, what strikes me is if you're old enough to remember the introduction of Limby workers, the whole point of Limby workers was that it was going to deal with the uncertainty about the edge of where employment was. So they were just going to extend protections sufficiently far out that no one ever need worry about worker status again or employment status again. Of course, now all the arguments are about the blurred boundary of Limby. So it's hard to see how you could ever come up with uh, a bright line test that wouldn't be a disastrous because it would allow bad employers to to exploit it, but also wouldn't be rapidly undermined and 
put into the fuzz by both lawyers and judges acting together. I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, 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 was a, I am old enough to remember the Limby worker concept coming in. And um, uh, actually with, with, with Brendan Birchall, I did some research in the late nineties, which the, the then Labour government um, used. I don't think we inspired the Limby worker idea, but we did some work on it. Um, and it was absolutely intended to do, as you say, Sean, to, to be a safety net beneath the employee concept. But of course, legal reasoning being what it is, inevitably there's uncertainty, as you say, about the, about the worker concept, the substitution clause, a contractual device to, to nullify worker status, in a way is invented by, by law firms and others just for this purpose. So there's an arms race going on between claimants and defendants and their lawyers, of course, this is, this is the way the law works. So we'll never abolish um, incompleteness and we don't want to. The um, open textured fabric of legal language is critical for enabling the law to change, I would argue. The term employee can shift its meaning over time, but it's also critical for, de for democracy. It's critical for democracy that we have the openness of natural language to fall back on and that we do not automate these processes. This is aside from the very important point you make, that having a bright line rule will favour the powerful. We need ex post reasoning to respond to the power of the large platform companies. Absolutely. We cannot do what the Chicago School wants us to do, make everything ex ante rationalizable. This is a very, very dangerous step. But it's no accident that the law and economics scholars from Chicago, actually, I'm, I'm not against Chicago. I, I, I was there myself at one time. I understand about Chicago. Um, but the Chicago School, okay, has mutated into the AI school. That, that, that's no accident. Yeah. If, 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 if you treat law as a commodity, then you see no harm in automating it. Yeah. Thank you. John, did you want to come back or are you fine? No, I didn't. That was an excellent response. Thank you. Great. And it's also really great to have people like you joining this debate. It's, it's not just academics. The whole aim of the series this term is very much to have a really diverse population. So I really appreciate you participating and contributing. OK, I want to hand over to uh, Brendan is going to ask some comments. And after that, Louise. So uh, Brendan, fire ahead. Yeah, I think this is maybe carrying on with the theme in your last response time. But as you were saying, there are the situations where um, machine learning AI has been particularly powerful in pattern recognition, whether it's in discovering cancer cells and or galaxy black holes and can do this far better than humans can do it. And you, one of the distinctions you draw between that situation and the situations you'll look at is whether something exists out there in nature or not. Is there another very important distinction here? And we know whenever you bring in an algorithmic based system, if there are powerful forces out there, institutions who would set to gain by confounding that system, then there's all sorts of ways in which it can fall over. And I, whether it's the, you know, it was in with, with manipulation of markets, as we've seen again recently, manipulations of statistics, league tables, and wouldn't the law be very prone to that sort of interference by all sorts of underhand or abovehand means? if we start relying on algorithms. Absolutely. And I, I, I think the, the kind of um, epistemological point we're discussing about, about law and reality seems very abstract, doesn't it? But it's absolutely critical. I regard legal ideas and legal concepts and legal rules as part of social reality. So one part of social reality is influencing another part. You know, it, it's, it's not that the law is outside reality but the law is constituting the object of regulation, it doesn't just negatively or passively respond to it. So I think we would want to say that, um, that the shape of the face, the elephant, the black hole, that's gonna be there whether or not we're studying it and, and we, we, it presumably exists um, separately from any conceptualization of it. Because a, a concept like employee does not exist separately from our conceptualization of it, this reflexivity causes major, major problems. It certainly opens up the, the possibility of, of abuse and exploitation, but critically, it also creates a problem if the representation of the world doesn't take account of itself. Now, now this again may seem like one of those famous Lumonian paradoxes, but representation systems that treat the world as one thing and the representation system itself as, as simply observing it and not changing it on the other often run into problems. 
We see this with um, early algorithms used in financial markets, for example, like the Black Skulls formula for um, options pricing. Um, the reason that long-term capital management basically failed, the, the company which used this formula, one of the reasons was because their own pricing model didn't take into account the existence of their own model, which produced these perverse non-linear feedback effects, which basically brought, brought the market down. Um, I understand some sophisticated financial models now do take into account their own existence. Now, the law, through its use of natural language, um, actually does this. A lawyer would say the law identifies itself very often as a force shaping reality. A lawyer would define a contract as what the law says it is. It's very important, I think. Law has been aware without realizing it, you know, of its own reflexivity. Machine learning, by contrast, I think, does assume a fairly radical separation, doesn't it, between the algorithm and the reality it's attempting to describe. So the, the, these are real problems we need to get to grips with. And I'm, I'm not saying that machine learning couldn't be improved to capture some of these effects. And I'm not saying law isn't in some way algorithmic. I think we need to recognize that it might be and, and, and appreciate the danger. But I think more work needs to be done on what natural language can do that, that mathematical models cannot do. And the way in which representations interact in a very complex way with, with the reality of society. And of course, as you say, um, something I hadn't really thought of, but I think you're right, the possibilities for power to be exercised in this process are absolutely there. And mystifying all this as, as somehow neutral um, is, is very potentially damaging, yeah. yeah. Brendan, did you want to come back or are you good on that? Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Louise who has some comments she'd like to make. And we've got uh, six minutes left and I have one last question I'd like to, about uh, judicial decision-making through predictive analytics. So Louise, would you like to tell us who you are and where you're from? Oh, hi, um, so I'm Louise and um, I'm working with Simon at the CBR. So looking at, um, yeah, one of the projects we've been working on is looking at sort of coding um, labor protection over a whole bunch of different countries. Um, and yeah, so I guess, yeah, my interest very much in, in labor law and um, very interesting to see the, the developments and, and this kind of, I don't know if you can call it erosion, but what's kind of happening with, with companies like Uber and Lyft. And um, yeah, so I think my, my question was, I was really interested by what Simon you said about um, common law sort of developing and, and efficient decisions kind of standing and the inefficient ones sort of being challenged and, and kind of withering away if, if they have been challenged. Um, and that, so I was thinking, you know, in the context of Uber and um, these companies, obviously having um, employee or worker status is a very inefficient decision for them. So yeah, so looking at, I guess my question is to what degree is it kind of just big powerful companies that determine that the future of worker status or employee status and um, I think what Brendan mentioned with um, yeah kind of the the power to influence these algorithms and making these decisions and um, it kind of was a question that yeah to, to what degree I guess you've sort of answered it by saying you know by we can't really help completely um, or to make kind of legal decisions, we do need that element of um, judicial decision. Um, but yeah, I guess guarding against that sort of powerful organizations that, that do have the power to litigate inefficient or inconvenient decisions and, and guarding against that. Um, Louise, yeah. could I pick up, there's another couple of hands put up as well, just before we close. For those of you who have to leave at two, join us next week for more fun and action and stimulation. Glenn Morgan, you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask what your comment would be as well as to, sorry, Louise, you can pick up those as well, but Glenn, do you want to tell us? You, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about, about the question of time in this and time from the point of view of the legal process. So a case starts, uh, say against Uber or, or Lyft, uh, but then there's a period of time through which that goes through various uh, courts, different levels of courts, etc. And other and, and the companies at the same time are becoming more deeply embedded 
in certain you know certain environments certain economies and so i just wonder about i think you mentioned it at the start this lack of synchronicity between uh the length of time that the judicial process can go on for and what companies can do whilst that process is still going when they're embedded in a, in their developing their business, developing their strategy, et cetera. No, thank you very Is much. Is that a question? <laughs> so a question about different arenas. So I answer both those questions now, Jackie. Yeah, yes, please. Yes. So so thank you very much indeed for both those questions. So so um Louise, I, I, I agree with you, of course, that in fact what we're talking about here is not really um, an efficient outcome in, in some global sense or wel welfare economic sense, but often just particular groups benefiting as against others. And Priest's problem is that he, he assumes that it's the inefficient rules which get litigated against, but really it's the rules which impose a private cost, not a social cost in, in Coase's sense, which tend to get litigated against. So the rules, if, if his theory is correct, would reflect the interests of insurance companies and powerful repeat players. Um, now, on the other hand, we can change civil litigation rules to permit um, no win, no fee litigation. We can encourage, uh, we can expand legal aid to address the balance. So there are ways we can, we can make the legal the litigation system itself more democratic and less tilted towards the very powerful. But often it is difficult to resist their power, I agree. Legislation, on the other hand, reflects a world in which in principle it's one person, one vote and we don't weight votes by wealth. So in principle, legislation should produce more democratic egalitarian outcomes. And on the whole, it does. Most of the time, labor protection is statutory, isn't it? Not um, common law protection. What Uber has shown is that even the legislative process can be bought. This is a, a, a potentially very, very worrying development that uh, a company can spend $200 million on a campaign to undo a law which the legislature has adopted. Um, it shows us, you might think, uh, the difficulties of referendums and plebiscites, but even on a wet Brexit day, I don't think we should go there just now. I think what we can see is clear um, commodification of the, of the legislative process and some really severe constitutional difficulties as a result of Uber's massive spending. When you think about the limits on campaign spending in the UK, how much a political party can spend on a general election campaign, Uber's campaign to reverse this law dwarfed that, you know. So the commodification of the lawmaking process in America is a consequence of decisions the courts arrived at to permit campaign funding, the Citizens United case, massive corporate funding going into PACs in America. Yes, yeah, a serious problem, but it's not the end of the matter. I think we'll see a constitutional pushback against this plebiscite, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Glenn's question is really fascinating. It, the Uber case has taken forever uh, to get to the Supreme Court, um, four or five years. In the meantime, Uber has been rapidly changing its boilerplate to, to render the court judgment ineffective. However, one interesting feature of legal decision making is that it's, it's often retrospective in the sense that the court will interpret the common law to mean what is always meant and will interpret the statute again to mean what it has always meant. So the effect is often retrospective and can upset a company which was bargaining on getting out of the, um, the, the position the law puts it in. Uh, so it's risky for Uber to, 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 to drag out the litigation process. Um, the wider political dynamic of what's going on here is I think the court is very much aware that if it finds for Uber, this shuts down the decision, uh, the discussion really and the law will have to be amended by statute. So it may not even be in Uber's interest to win this case. They may be happy to lose it, uh, but it could be a pyrrhic victory for the, for the Labour side here. But if, if Uber wins the case, the pressure for statutory reform will be, will be overwhelming because if, if they win, the current legislation is not fit for purpose and everybody would recognise that. Gosh, I'm really hesitant to uh, close this discussion down because it's so interesting. There's so many other questions I'd like to ask in particular. I mean, I'm going to ask one and for those of you who have to go, have to go. And Gemma and the team can put up a poll where you can vote to uh, give us feedback on this event. But I do actually want to ask this question now because Sean Jones is here and he's dealt with the Hermes case. Steve Rolfe and myself and a colleague at Eversheds are working on that case as well. For, and very short summaries. Um, 
here you see a case of employers trying to actually improve some of the benefits uh, that they're offering their delivery drivers outside the realms of the law to a certain extent. Um, now where, where is that a potential catalyst for change? So some of these law, these firms are doing it because they don't want to end up in court, which is often a, uh, we've seen that in the past since the 1980s when companies took uh, proactive decisions to improve benefits for part-time workers, for example, because they didn't want to go to the ECJ like uh, Bilka Kaufhaus did. So have you anything to say about that particular case where you may see on one hand, we have a story of Uber, Uberization domination, but do we see other examples of uh, companies that are trying to improve the conditions of these workers in some constructive way? I have to ask it because we're working on that topic right now. And, uh, and for those of you who have to go, lovely having you, please come back next week. We've got, and then many of these discussions will go on for the rest of the term. Simon, can I hand over to you on that one? Yes, of course. Now, I, I think it's absolutely right that the law can catalyse um, productive developments in, in practice and that there is this interaction between practice, the law, all the time um, in, in the work which you know about, Jackie, that I did on, on equal pay a few years ago. We saw collective bargaining and litigation catalyzing each other, didn't we, in the, in the 2010s in the UK. And the same thing is happening here. What's most interesting about the research you're doing with, with Steve and others, I think, is that we see the union, as I understand it, proactively involved in uh, trying to organize worker status or LIMBY worker status in a way that might, might resolve this, this question. The work I did with Brendan back in the 1990s was very much, it was employer-led practice that was leading to the use of contractual boilerplate and the unions were nowhere at that point. Now they're more actively engaged, as I understand it, in, in, in using the law in a constructive way. This is the IWGB, union, I guess, and maybe some others too. Um, the um, position of a LIMB worker as somebody who gets the protection of labour law up to a point, the minimum wage, but also is self-employed for tax purposes, may be highly beneficial to the people in that position because they get a tax advantage if they're self-employed, but also some labour protection. I'm not sure that um, the wider consequences are always good though, because if, if the category of workers who are not paying tax increases, but they get some labor rights, the tax base is potentially eroded. But when I've made this point in other contexts, I've understood this, 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 this may not be what the union wants or always for its members. It may want self-employment status for tax purposes, but some labor protections. The public role of the contract of employment, however, is to maintain the tax base. As the Californian Supreme Court very clearly said in the dynamics case, the definition of the employment contract is a public issue. So these developments in collective bargaining are very exciting and interesting. At the same time, we mustn't forget the public function which the employment contract uh, performs, I think. Brilliant, thank you, Simon. Right, in uh, exploiting my role as the chair and not keeping to time, which is also fine sometimes, does anybody else who'd like to have a last question or comment to make? If not, you could put it in the chat and I'll try and pick it up. If not, can I first of all thank Simon for, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a reminder here to say, can you fill in the poll that's come up on your screen? Um, first of all, can I thank Simon for, do, for kicking off this second series in such a brilliant way? I mean, it's been such a challenging intellectual concepts within the legal dimension, how they're related to the political economy of what's going on in different societies, absolutely fascinating. I think you've you know, really been, helped us learn a lot. These are some of the themes that we're going to be picking up throughout the series this term. So, for example, they will come up in the work and the contribution from Janine Berg on the 3rd of March and Janine's from the ILO. I think there's also a very interesting contribution from Robin Allen and Dean Masters who are looking at how equality organisations in Europe are trying to deal with some of this predictive analytics and algorithmic decision making, a topic we haven't even really got onto today about the work you see in uh, Virginia Eubanks on uh, judicial, judicial decisions in the United States. That's a whole topic in itself, but we can't go there today. So I hope that you'll be able to join us next week when Simon Greenman, who's coming from, um, he's a founder of the company Best Practice AI, and he's also a member of the World Economic Forum, uh, Global AI Council. So hopefully Simon will have uh, very interesting insights to bring us from the world of business and how some of those um, issues have been discussed in that forum. And we've got other contributions later in the series from the European Trade Union Institute and as I said, the ILO. 
Lovely. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it and have a hopefully sunny wet Wednesday 